Hey Law Nerds, this is Professor Tracy from Law Simply Explained with another video, this one on conditional gifts. So we're gonna cover three things this lecture. The first is we're gonna look back at what we've said about promises and consideration already. Then we're gonna look at what are conditional gifts and what distinguishes them from a contract and from just a plain old gratuitous promise. So let's start by taking a look back at where we've been. So we introduced this chart in our lecture on consideration. And we said we first got to start out by asking, has the promisor, the alleged promisor, made a promise? We said we judge that by asking whether they have made an outward expression, a manifestation, either spoken word or written word or conduct by which they've expressed an intention to act or refrain from acting in a specified way. So that makes sense. That's what a promise is, right? I promise I will stop picking my nose. I promise I will uh, I will go buy chocolate bars for you. That Those are all manifestations of an intention to act or not act in a specified way. And we said we judge whether or not somebody has made a promise, that whether the alleged promisor has made a promise, by asking whether a reasonable person in the shoes of the promisee would think that this manifestation from the promisor is in fact a commitment. And we do that, we said, because we can't base it on what the promisor in her head was thinking or intended because we can't read her mind, right? And also, we're not going to base it on just the subjective belief of the promisee because, well, what if their belief's unreasonable? And so we're judging it on a reasonableness standard and we're saying if we look at this manifestation and we give the ordinary meaning to the to the ordinary words that are used, the technical meaning to the technical words that are used, and look at all the surrounding circumstances, does it appear that the promisor in fact made a commitment? So if we say yes, we then have to ca categorize the promise as either being contractual, in which case it is likely to be legally enforceable, or gratuitous, which we said means it's likely not legally enforceable, subject to some exceptions we'll look at later, indeed later even in this lesson. So we said if it looks like it's contractual, meaning that it's part of a contract or an exchange, a trade, a barter, uh, then we've got to ask, well, does it really in fact meet all the elements of a contract? And our focus now is on formation. We said there are three elements of a contract, offer, acceptance, and consideration. Our focus is consideration. Now, some books uh, case books start with offer and some actually start with remedies. In this case, I've decided to take up consideration since that's really the heart of what a contract is all about. It's sort of the bargain or the exchange at the center of the contract. And we said that we need to look and say, how do we determine if there is consideration for a promise, if indeed it's part of an exchange. Well, we have this framework here for consideration. So we look and we say, well, is the promise part of a bargain for exchange? Meaning that when the promisor made the promise to the promisee, did it induce some sort of detriment from the promisee? And by detriment, we said we mean that it is causing the promisee to incur some sort of legal obligation she didn't have already. And we then said that we have to ask also, is that detriment that was incurred by the promisee what motivated the promisor or induced the promisor to make her promise in the first place. And so we said that when we think about a detriment, not only is it about incurring an obligation that wasn't incurred before, but we said there are two kinds of detriments. Either we have what falls under the heading of a bilateral contract, which is 
a promise for a promise, meaning that the promisor's promise induced the promisee to make a return promise, but it could also be that it falls under the label of a unilateral contract in that the promisor's promise induces a return performance. And we saw this in the lesson on consideration where Barb was looking for a return performance from Bob when she posted signs about having lost her dog and seeking her, for someone to return her dog saying, I promise to pay a $500 reward if someone finds my dog and returns it to me. She's not looking for a commitment from Bob or anybody else that they're gonna find the dog. She wants them to find the dog and bring it and that's what she's bargaining for. So those are the two kinds of detriments. So they're either gonna fall under bilateral with a return promise or unilateral with a return performance. And we said we also need to ask whether the things that are being exchanged are of legal value. Now, we said that that is often very obvious, and if you've satisfied the first part of our definition here of a bargain for exchange, you almost undoubtedly have the second. But remember, it's this part of legal value, it's either a benefit to the promisor or a detriment to the promisee. We don't need both. We could have both, but we don't need it, which is different than on a bargain for exchange. We need both of the elements of the promisor's promise inducing a detriment from the promisee and the promisee's detriment inducing the promisor's promise in the first place. So when we're asking about a benefit to the promisor, it is what it sounds like, right? That is it something of benefit to the person who made the promise? So for instance, a commitment to pay them money. Um, is it a detriment? And we said that in the context of consideration, when we say detriment, we do not mean harmful or bad. We mean that the promisee is incurring some sort of obligation they didn't have before, because if they already have the obligation, then it's not a legal detriment to them. So we want to look at some examples here. So we've got Bob and Barb back to help us out again. Uh, so Bob, in, uh, in they are greeting one another as they do, and then Bob says, Barb, I will mow your lawn on Friday at 2 p.m. if you will agree to pay me $20. So this is the same kind of example we looked at in the lesson on consideration. So Bar Bob has made a promise to mow Barb's lawn. Uh, so we know that and all the elements are met. And then we, so we know that if Bob made a promise, then we can label Bob the promisor. He's the party that made the promise and Barb the promisee, the party to whom the promise was made. So what we have to ask though is, is there anything in return? And certainly if you recall Bob's manifestation, he said, if you will pay me $20. So he was certainly seeking a commitment back from Barb. So here, if the answer is nothing, that there's no consideration given for Bob's promise, then his promise would be gratuitous and it would not be legally enforceable. But if there is a return promise or return performance, then it, there's likely consideration and his promise would be legally enforceable. So Barb here says, Bob, that sounds swell. I'm happy to pay you $20 to mow my lawn on Friday afternoon. So she is agreeing to what Bob proposed. And remember, Bob said, I'll mow your lawn if you'll pay me $20. She's agreeing and saying, I will pay you $20. And so she has made a return promise, that's the detriment, right? That she's incurring a, an obligation to pay Bob $20 that she did not otherwise have. So Bob's promise has induced a detriment from Barb the promisee. And we said that if it's a promise for a promise, it falls under the label of bilateral contract. And so if we're looking and saying, well, is, is Bob's promise to mow Barb's lawn, in fact, supported by consideration. And we would say, well, we just said it has induced a detriment from Barb, a return promise to pay him the 
And that detriment is what motivated Bob to promise to mow her lawn in the first place, right? That's what he was seeking. He wasn't seeking just to mow her lawn for fun. He wanted her to commit to pay him for doing it. And we can, so if both of those are met and they are, we know we have a bargain for exchange. Then we have to say, well, is this return promise to pay Bob the promisor $20 of benefit to him? Of course it is, right? That That's a benefit he's going to get paid $20, or at least he has a legally enforcement, enforceable commitment from her to pay him $20. Is it a detriment to her? Yes, right? We said we don't need both of these things under legal value, but we have them because here it's a detriment. Why? Because she was not otherwise obligated to pay Bob the $20. So she's incurred an obligation she did not otherwise have, which means we have both. Again, you don't need both. We have them. That means there's legal value. So we have both a bargain for exchange and that the thing being exchanged is of legal value. So we have consideration. Bob's promise is supported by consideration. So it's contractual and it is legally enforceable. So it's not gratuitous. That means if Bob were to breach his promise and to not mow her lawn on Friday afternoon, then Barb likely could legally enforce that promise. So she could run into court and sue to get a remedy to, to enforce that promise, to get the court to enforce it for her. And so let's look at conditional gifts. Having reviewed what a promise is, what consideration is, let's take a look at conditional gifts. Now, a conditional gift here is a situation where the promisor intends to give a gift, which we know already that's a gratuitous promise, right? Because the promisor is making the promise with the intent not to get anything in return, right? They're not seeking any kind of detriment. They're not motivated to make the promise of the gift because they want something from the promisee. They just want to make a gift. But the unique thing about a conditional gift is the word conditional, right? That there is a condition on it. So there's an event that must occur before the promisee may receive the benefit of the gift. So we can chunk this and break it apart into its elements here. And for our purposes, there's really only two big parts of this where we need to look and say, one, does it appear that the promisor in fact intends to make a gift? And two, is there a condition? Is there some sort of event that must occur before the promisee may receive the benefit of the gift? And we'll look in more detail what that means because it may sound a little obtuse at this point, but we have these two big elements then. One, the promisor intends to give a gift and two, the gift is conditioned on the occurrence of an event. So let's look at the intent to give a gift. So we know that normally that is a situation where the promisor makes a promise to the promisee to give a gift. It's a gratuitous promise. There's nothing coming the other way. And even if there were, it would not be something that was sought out by the promisor. And that's important to understand, right? So let's assume that the promisee for some reason was like, oh, you gave me a gift. Well, I promise to give you a gift. So you could look at it and say, well, it looks like there may be a bargain for exchange because the promisor's promise of a gift did induce a detriment from the promisee because they promised to give a return gift. But then you need to realize, okay, you can say, okay, that may be true. So the first part of a bargain exchange may be there, but if the promisor didn't make the promise in the first place in order to get that detriment, right? The detriment the, of the promisee saying, oh, I need to, I'll promise to give you a gift too. Then there is no bargain for exchange. It's just the promisee of their own volition deciding that, oh, I, you know, I feel obligated now to give you a gift. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't turn it in to a bargain for exchange. So here, let's contrast a promise or of, of, of a gift with an ordinary bargain for exchange or a bargain for detriment. 
So ordinarily, with a contractual promise, we said, the promisor is making the promise, seeking the detriment, and then the promisee is proffering that. We saw that in our first example, where Bob was promising to mow Barb's lawn, but he was doing so explicitly seeking a detriment from Barb, which was a return promise to pay of to have Barb pay him $20. And so ordinarily then you'd have the promisor making a promise, seeking a detriment, and that promise inducing the detriment. So we could say the first part of a bargain for exchange is met because the promisor's promise, like Bob, his promise to mow the lawn induced a detriment back, a promise to pay him $20. But we can also say the second part of a bargain for exchange is met because we know that that's what Bob was seeking in the first place because he said, if you will pay me $20. So that detriment it was what motivated him to promise to mow her lawn in the first place. We could say, yes, there's a bargain for exchange. With the promise of a gift, those elements are not necessarily met. So what makes something a conditional gift is the promisor saying, I will give a gift if a particular event occurs. And we'll look at some examples of that, as opposed to just, I promise to give you a gift. And then it's possible that the condition that's on there is something that requires the promisee to cause the event to occur, as it were. So let's look at how that might look. So event, the events we're talking about, not only with conditional events or conditional gifts, but more broadly when we start looking at things like uh, conditional promises or condi contract conditions, um, the, the definition is the same. It may play out differently because of the context, but this basic definition is true. Um, here, what we're talking about is the promisor making a promise of a gift here, and it's conditioned on some sort of event occurring, and it's something outside the control of the promisor. So what does that mean? Well, that means there's two possibilities of what the event might be. It's either going to be the promisee, right, the person who's... Um, the person to whom the promise was made, it's going to be some action or forbearance from them or something outside the control of either party. So let's look at some possibilities. So it could be the promisor saying something like, I will give you a movie ticket if you meet me at the movie theater. So the condition there, what's the event? It requires the promisee to meet the promisor at the movie theater. So it's an event that is within the control of the promisee. It could be if it's sunny. For instance, you could say, I will take, I will take you to the park on Thursday afternoon if it's sunny. That is a, a promise of a conditional gift, but that event is something outside the control of either party. Right? Neither of them can control the weather. So that would be also a conditional gift, but the event in question is outside the control of either party. It could be, come by my house. Let's say I have a couch to give away. And I say, if you come by my house after class, I will give you my couch. So that is an example, again, of an event. That event is within the control of the promisee, the person to whom I've made the promise of the free couch. So it could be, if you think about a television show, saying you could say something to an actor or showrunner or somebody saying, I will renew your contract, assuming the network renews the television show or Netflix renews the television show then we will renew our contracts with you. So that would be an example of a condition, although probably not in the context of a gift, uh, probably in the context of an actual contract. But um, nonetheless, it's an example of a condition, an event that is probably in the case of the, you know, the showrunner, the actor, and you know, the parties involved in making the show, 
is outside their control, right? They, net, they can't control whether Netflix renews or the network or whatever. So I, it's important, you'll remember that we said one thing is not deemed to be a condition. It can't be something like, if I'm feeling jolly on, uh, on Monday, then I will take you to the park. Or maybe that's not a great example because you could argue that's outside of the person's control. But it, it could be something like, if I, if I eat Captain Crunch on Monday morning, then I will take you to the movie on Monday evening. That condition that I'm putting in is something completely within my control, right? So that's not an acceptable condition because the event is not, um, is not asking the other party to do anything, nor is it something outside the control. It's just silliness, right? Because it's like, well, I can control that. It's essentially saying, well, I'll do this if I feel like it. And that's not going to work. So let's continue to look at examples here. Let's assume we have a situation just like one of the conditions we talked about, which is if you'll meet me at the movie theater, and this one's similar, but it's if you come by my house after work. So Barb says, Bob, I have an extra ticket for the new Marvel movie. If you come by my house after work, I will give you the ticket. So we can look at this and say, there is a promise, right? The ordinary meaning of that language is that it's a commitment, right? I will give you the ticket. She has made a manifestation by spoken word of an intention to act in a particular way, right? To say, I will give you the movie ticket. So it's a promise to give a gift, right? To give a gift here. But we know that you could say, okay, there's a promise to give the ticket. And so that's the first thing we need to make sure is, does it look like the person's intending to give a gift? Here it does, right? But we need to say there's more to it, right? Because it's if you come by my house after work. So there's a condition before it, which is there's an event that's not within her control as the promise sword, but within Bob's control as the promise C, which is he come by her house after work. That's the event that must take place. And we have to ask, well, what does that look like? Barb there with her movie ticket and says, I will give you a movie ticket. We said she's made a promise of a gift, but it's got a condition. It says, if you come by my house. Now let's assume that Bob satisfies that condition, right? He comes by the house. Well, what does that mean? It means then that he has satisfied that condition and quote qualifies for the gift, right? So he qualifies and the gift is his. He stopped by, right? He stopped by. And we'll see what if he doesn't come by her house and the condition is not satisfied. Well, what does that mean? It means he does not qualify for the gift. It, there's a condition on it, an event that must occur. He doesn't satisfy that condition. Then he's not entitled to the gift. So let's look at that in the context of our kind of promises back and forth. And, and I think it's important to understand what's going on here. Let's, let's back up just a second here. Remember, we said that Barb has made the promise to give a movie ticket, but it has an, a condition which must be satisfied before Bob qualifies to receive that gift. Now, one thing we'll see here right away is it's tempting when you hear that kind of phraseology. If you will come by my house, then you will qualify for this movie ticket. It sounds like a bargain for exchange on the face of it, right? But one, we know that Barb is intending to make a gift. But even if we say, well, let's run it through our our. Uh, structure or an analytical structure for consideration and start with, well, is there a bargain for exchange here? So if we have a situation, whoops, if we have a situation here and Bob is, Bob is going to undertake to come to her house. So you could say that Barb's promise 
of a movie ticket has induced a detriment from Bob, right? And that's actually true, right? That he is he is going to stop by her house or commit to do that and then do it. And that's not, based on the facts as we have them, an obligation that he otherwise had. So you could say that, well, didn't her promise of a movie ticket induce a detriment from, from him? And the answer is, yeah, it probably did, but you need to go to the second part of a bargain for exchange, which asks, what is that detriment of Bob coming by her house what motivated her to promise the ticket in the first place? And without other facts, the answer is no. She intended to make a gift. And she's, there's no indication that she really wanted Bob to stop by her house. It's just, if you want it, you got to come by. So the, the detriment of him coming by the house is not what has motivated her to promise the ticket to him in the first place. So we can look at this and say, well, it has a condition. So the promise here is, you know, he, he's got to come by the house, right? And we said, if he does come by the house, then he qualifies, right? But we need to keep in mind that although the promisor, Barb's promise, is in fact inducing a detriment from Bob, that detriment is not what motivated her to make the promise of the ticket in the first place, right? That's what makes it a conditional gift. It's not only is there condition on it that is imposing, at least in this case, a detriment on the promisee Bob, but that detriment is not what motivated her to promise the ticket. We would need more facts that suggest that she really wanted him to come by her house. And we don't have that. So if we're looking at this, we know that for a conditional gift, to put it in that category, we would say that one, the promisor, by the plain language, the ordinary meaning of the words, or the technical meaning, surrounding circumstance, intended to make a gift, but there was a condition on it. And we said there's something distinct about that condition, which I mentioned already. So the key things here are there's a detriment, yes, right? A detriment that, for instance, Bob has to come by the house, but that is not what she's bargaining for. That's not what induced her to promise the ticket in the first place. So the second part of a bargain for exchange is missing. And the key, other key thing to understand is that it's still a gratuitous promise, even though it has a condition on it. So it's not legally enforceable. So even if the condition is satisfied and Bob quote qualifies, it's not, it's no different than any other gratuitous promise. If Barb reneges on it or breaches, it's not legally enforceable. Now with, a, with the promise of a gift, so let's, let's start there. All I was going to say is this, that with the promise of a gift, there is an exception, right? We said gratuitous promises, like a promise of a gift, as a general matter, are not legally enforceable. So the person to whom the promise was made would not be able to run into court to sue to enforce it. However, one of the exceptions is if the gift has already been made, for instance, if Barb gave Bob the ticket, she couldn't come back to him and say, give back the ticket because it was a gratuitous promise when I made it to you. So let's look at this first part, which I've already said, that the detriment is not bargained for. So here, if we look at this example, again, remember, is there a detriment? Yes, right? That there is a detriment, which is that Bob must come by Barb's house. But we said that's not what is motivating her, not what's inducing her to make the promise. So we can say the first part of a bargain for exchange is met in that she is making the promise and of a gift, of a ticket, and yes, it has induced a detriment from Bob, but that detriment is not what motivated her or induced her to make the gift. She's not dying to have Bob come by the house. And so that's why we would drop it out and say, yeah, it induced a detriment, right? As we're looking at this, we would say that under a bargain for exchange, we could say, yes, it did induce a detriment from Bob, but it that detriment of Bob coming by the house is not what induced her to make the promise in the first place. So we would say that means what? 
if both elements of a bargain for exchange are not met, then that means there isn't one. And that means there can't be consideration. It's still this promise of a, of a movie ticket, despite inducing Bob to come by the house, is still just gratuitous. There's no consideration for it. And therefore, as a general rule, it is not something legally enforceable. That Bob would not be able to sue Barb for not giving him the ticket. So it's still gratuitous. And that's this second part, which is to say, even though there's a condition on it, and even though it's inducing a detriment from Bob, that doesn't make it somehow uh, contractual in nature, somehow that there's consideration. It's not. And we just showed why. It's still gratuitous. And that means what? That it's not enforceable right? That gratuitous promises are not legally enforceable. And that's true even if Bob satisfies the condition. He doesn't, quote, earn it or make it legally binding just because he swings by her house after work. She can be, be difficult and not very nice. And even though he comes by the house, not give him the ticket. And Bob would have no legal recourse. So, it's revocable by the promise source. So Barb could renege on her promise without legal liability, right? That goes kind of hand in hand uh, with saying it's gratuitous and not legally enforceable, even if the condition occurs. And also, this is the exception I talked about, that once the promise source executes the gift, meaning that if Barb had given the ticket over to Bob, then that's different. It can't be revoked. It is in quote unquote enforceable, right? That she can't come back and say, oh, my promise of a gift was gratuitous at the time I made it. So therefore give me back the ticket. I want to undo the whole thing. That doesn't work. So that's, that's conditional gifts. So that is sort of a, a little side uh, sidelight with regard to consideration. And there's more to say about consideration. And we'll look at that in the next lesson. I hope that's helpful. As always, uh, I hope the, the lecture was helpful. If you could like and subscribe, I would greatly appreciate that. So I will be back soon with another lesson. See you soon.